So as promised, my sermon this morning is on the lectionary gospel text for today, John, Mark, Mark 16, 1 through 8. And if, I'm going to give you a minute if you want to look at the Bible in your view if you brought one with you. I'm going to the Easter Sunday Bible. Just kidding. Um, or you can just look it up on your phone, too. I have a Bible app and everything. You can Google it. So I want you to read along with me because you know some of you that this is the very tail end of the, the story. Mark. It ends here. Mark 16. Verses... One through eight. When the Sabbath was over, Mary Magdalene, remember her from John? She's in this one too. Mary, the mother of James, and Salome brought spices so that they could go and anoint Jesus' dead body. Very early on the first day of the week, just after sunrise, they came to the tomb. They were saying to each other, who's going to roll the stone away from the entrance for us? When they saw that the stone had been rolled away, and it was a very large stone. Going into the tomb, they saw a young man in a white robe seated on the right side, and they were startled. But he said to them, don't be alarmed. You are looking for Jesus of Nazareth, who was crucified. He has been raised. He isn't here. Look, here's the place where they laid him. Go and tell his disciples, especially Peter, that he is going ahead of you into Galilee. You will see him there, just as he told you. Overcome with terror and dread, they fled from the tomb. They said nothing to anyone because they were afraid. And those of you who are following along with me will see that's the end. Now, I know it's going to say in your Bible, like, there's like, it goes on to like verse 16, maybe some Bibles are different. Now that's a, it'll, it'll write right in there. That's a little tacked on. That's something that's been added later to make things make more sense. Essentially, this is how Mark ends his gospel. They get to the tomb. They see it's empty. There's somebody in there, a guy in white. They're terrified. He says, go and tell the disciples and Peter that he's been raised from the dead. And they were like, "Uh uh-uh. And they ran away and they didn't tell anybody. Now, if you've read Mark's gospel, you'll recognize this kind of motif because in the beginning of mark's gospel jesus was going around he was healing people he was teaching them teaching them parables he was asked what do you say about me and every time they recognized him who he all they almost recognized for who he was he would say don't tell anybody you are the christ don't don't tell anybody oh you've done this amazing don't tell anybody and then the one time the guy tells them, go tell. They don't do it. They don't do it. They, 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 they ran away because they were afraid. The end. It's, it, I mean, I know you've probably been to Easter service before, and you know there's other accounts of, of the resurrection. This is the short version. All you need to know is, He's crucified for the Sabbath because they can't mess with that. Put him in the tomb. And they couldn't go and anoint his body until the sun rose on Sunday morning because they had they were observing the Sabbath and do that stuff. So as soon as the Sabbath was over, they hightailed it over there, but they weren't thinking through this whole thing because they didn't know how they were going to get in there because of the big stone. Then they were like, "Oh, good! Somebody rolled the stone away." I'm sure they weren't like, oh, good. They were probably concerned. Would you ever come home to your house and you see your front doors wide open? You wouldn't be too happy about that. You'd be a little intrepidatious. You'd be like, eh, I don't know about going in. 
And then there's the sky there. And, of course, John's gospel says there's two angels. This gospel says there's one. The one in Matthew is described in how he's dressed and everything. This is just a man. Dressed in white, just like Matthew. And he's sitting there. And he says, I know who you're looking for. He's not here. But you need to go tell his disciples, especially Peter, that he's been raised. And gospel says that they don't tell anybody. Well, no, it got out. Right? Because we're here today. And when Matthew and Luke took Mark's gospel, because Mark first took information and, you know, gave their own spin and put their own information. There was a lot more in the other. The whole story of the walk to Emmaus where Jesus is walking with two other people and they're talking about all the stuff that's happened and he's right there among them and they recognize it until he breaks the bread. It's in Luke and there's a whole post-resurrection story. But in Mark you get nothing. You even get the resurrected Lord doing anything or going anywhere or with anyone. That's why they tacked on that. If you're looking in the Bible, if you, that's why they tacked, off that, tacked on that end so you have some of that. But the thing is, like, they don't really need that in there because somebody went and told. Somebody had to have because we wouldn't have the gospel story. In the beginning, he says, don't tell anyone who I am. And at the end, they say, go and tell, and they don't. You could just have to imagine Jesus showing up in Galilee and seeing Peter and the disciples. You, that's left to you to imagine, because it's not something that's written down. There's no account of it in Mark's gospel. There's just this projection of it through this man sitting in the tomb telling them. You have to imagine what it must have been like for Peter to see Jesus raised from the dead. Have you ever been given a second chance? Do you remember what Peter did? Jesus said, Peter, you're going to deny me. And Peter said, oh no, Lord, I'm not. And then he did it. All four Gospels tell you the same story about Peter. It's well known. He denied Jesus three times before the cock crowed. And then he fled in anguish and pain. And he hid. And the disciples hid. They were hiding. But the man in the tomb said, go and tell his disciples, especially Peter. Calls him by name. And Peter is given a second chance. And that's how they understood a lot more about Jesus' ministry and what he was all about. We know that someone told the story. Because after this happened, after the resurrection, a community formed around the hope that this resurrection brought. We could call that early community the God was here, but he ain't no more community. Amazed. And forever changed, they came together, gathering as Jesus had gathered them, to pray, to talk, to share bread with one another. For them, life was, perhaps for the first time, something more than just work and domestic tasks. Life was something more than their occupation and their marginalization. Life was something more than competition and apathy. Jesus' resurrection means that life holds promise and dedication. All those parables and speeches about the kingdom of God, they make sense in the light of the resurrection. It can happen. 
And the next time someone tells you that this is just uh, impossible, I want you to think about the empty tomb. All that Mark needed to get out was that he's been raised, he isn't here. He'll see you in Galilee. Now go tell him to expect him. There is now for those people, those early Christians, the hope of an eternal life and a heavenly reunion with our Creator. For them then and for us now, that eternal life begins in this life, here and now. The resurrection of Jesus Christ isn't just something to ensure your ticket to heaven. The resurrection of Jesus Christ formed an early community and began a movement to live out the ministry and work of Jesus Christ that really looked daunting until God raised him from the dead. And now, anything is possible. The resurrection tells us, as it told those early apostles back then, that yes, we can build this kingdom of God. It can happen. We can build a world that, like the tree that grows from the tiny mustard seed, in the parable of the mustard seed, we can build a world that is so large it can include every type of human being every creature under its shade. We can build a world that, like the workers in the vineyard, embraces a fair and generous consideration of our labor. We can build a world where the object of our scorn becomes the hero of our story, like in the Good Samaritan. We can build a world in which God's wounds to embrace us within the first little inkling that we might have a contrite heart. Like the father in the prodigal story. We can build a world where we love our enemies and persecutors. Not because we are weak, but because of a courageous resistance to not let hate take over. We can build a world of grace and forgiveness and empathy, a world where people go out of their way to heal others and to preserve their dignity. A world where that's important. We can build a community like they were building back then. And it might look a lot like what they often call the beloved community. Beloved community is a phrase coined by the guy who came up with the concept, Josias Royce, who is a philosopher and a theologian, and he found the Fellowship of Reconciliation to create this image of a beloved community. But the reason why you and I know about it today was because it was made famous by Reverend Dr. Martin Luther King, Jr. Rather than thinking that this beloved community was an abstract concept, King believed it could manifest in this life. I believe we could build it. Not a pie in the sky, not an ethereal concept, but a real life community. People in this skin doing this work. But something that exists in our life, in our time, in our community, keeps us from becoming the beloved community. Choose to retaliate rather than resist. We choose to harbor prejudice instead of refusing them and standing up against them. 
But until the beloved community, we have to resist poverty, racism, and violence. King believed we could do it here in America. He believed it. He thought we could build it here in America. Well, someone for something quite different disagreed with King and murdered him on April 4th in 1968. You see, building a community like that, like the one that Jesus rejected in the gospel through his parables and his teaching, it's simple, but it's not easy. In a culture that promotes greed and superiority and might makes right, we are perhaps unintentionally building quite the opposite of the beloved community. Sure, it may look beautiful for some, but until it's beautiful for all of us, none of us will be content to live in it. In the words of King, injustice anywhere is a threat to justice everywhere. If we don't resist, if we permit poverty and racism and violence to exist in our culture, we aren't living into the light of the resurrected Jesus. We aren't letting our light so shine. We are just putting our hands behind our back and feeling like, well, that's impossible. I can't do it. Is it impossible? The tomb was empty. That's impossible. We are often motivated by fear. Fear that someone will take what we have. Fear that someone will not love us. Fear that someone will hurt us, so we hurt them first. The disciples never quite understood what Jesus was all about until his death and resurrection. And after he was raised from the dead... What did they have to fear anymore? You see, the fear that the empty tomb alleviates, of course, they were afraid leaving the tomb because they didn't believe it. I wouldn't either. Don't blame them. But that fear has been lifted from us because of the resurrection. It means that beloved community is, is possible. It means that we don't have to be afraid. That man who shot King was afraid of something. What can stop us from building the world that Jesus envisioned with his teaching and example? Nothing. Let us be people of the resurrection, as inheritors of the Holy Spirit, building the beloved community. Not an ethereal concept to be absorbed, not a theoretical community, but a real community of real people making a real difference. Isn't that what the church ought to be? Because you know, it started out as a movement. In fact, it started out as a movement in those early days. If you read the Acts of the Apostles, that's what the early church looked like. And even reformers who've come along throughout the centuries to try to change it, they were trying to start a movement as well. No building, no institutional structure, no paid and appointed clergy, just community. People sharing prayers, sharing bread, choosing love. The good news, and what gives us hope today, is that communities do exist. There's little pockets in different places. Reverend Dr. Paul Smith was a disciple or student of, the doc, of Dr. Howard Thurman. And he is described as an iconoclastic. Do you know what that means? He's like smashing down altars and things that the church, the institutional church holds up. So he's iconoclastic minister. He made it his life's work to establish multiracial churches in Buffalo, Atlanta, St. Louis, and Brooklyn. 
the beloved community here in America. King's Vin. I think Paul Smith really believes in the resurrection. There's been a community like this nearby. One that doesn't have a, a building. Is there with a building? How do you have a church without a building? Well, guess what? South Street. <laughs> they didn't have a building. They had more than four walls, more than one hour on Sunday morning. They were a community to live out the mission that God had put on their hearts to build beloved community intentionally, not by accident, not by refusing to make complaint, but instead of refusing to make complaint, being intentional, intentional about including. We can build the beautiful, we can build the beloved community here. And the reason why I'm confident we can is because there is an empty tomb. And if God is Jesus Christ from the dead, it's all played into his ministry and his life and the things that he tried to teach us, then we can follow him to the cross if we need to. Dr. King, who gave up his life. We follow him into a kingdom that looks a lot more fair and equitable for everyone living in it. Into a kingdom where we care for one another, where we pray for one another, where we share our bread. Uh, we, we did a little bit of that this morning, didn't we? Got around the table, put some syrup on the bread. But it's possible. Happen. We need to keep at it. Keep working towards it. They didn't have it figured out. Remember the part that they ran away and didn't tell anyone they were told to? The message still got out. We're going to falter. We're not going to do it right. But we need to keep trying, keep believing that we can build the beloved community, that we can have a movement like they did in Acts. It may not look like this. It may not have organs and stained glass and shoes and hats on Easter Sunday. We don't have any hats this morning. It may look different, but what I'm saying is Jesus' gospel is still there and the church will always exist. It may not look like this, but it will never cease to be from the earth. Because God has intended this relationship with us, and God wants to raise us out from our tombs. Amen. We're going to attempt, like we do every year, the Holy Chorus by Volunteer Congregation. <laughs> but our choir has practiced this, and they will lead us in it. So anybody that would like to join, I see folk going up to sing along with the choir, because they've got all the parts and the different bits. And um, if you feel so led, actually, Noah is not going to give us an option. <laughs> Would you please stand as you are able as we sing the Hallelujah Chorus. 